All right. You will take your Bibles out, please. Open them to the book of Genesis, the 18th chapter. Join me in standing as we come to the Word of God out of reverence for the reading of His Word. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 18, and we will begin at verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I have not found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Please... Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. I will bring you a morsel of bread, that you may refresh your hearts, and after that you may pass by, as much as you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah, and said quickly, Make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, and took a tender and good calf, and gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. They said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, Here in the tent. He said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have the pleasure of my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child, since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. But he said, No, but she did laugh. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham surely become, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what the right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now, who am I but dust and ashes? and taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the fifty righteous. Would you destroy all the city for the lack of five? So he said, No, if I find there forty-five, I will not destroy it. He spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be forty found in him. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of forty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty should be found in him. So he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. Then he said, Indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak of the Lord. Suppose twenty should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of the twenty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. And Abraham returned. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you give to us grace to understand. God, grace to see the justice and the mercy balanced in your person. Grace to see the wonder of you condescending to interact with your servant in this way. 
We pray, Father, that you would make us mindful that always, from the very beginning, before anything was made, the plan of redemption has been the plan. There was never any intention that a world without sin would exist, for then we would not know the redeeming love of our God. We pray, Lord, that you would press that truth on us when we despair in dark days. Remind us that even these days are according to your purpose, and that nothing happens apart from that purpose. Remind us, God, that nothing has the power to thwart your will, no matter what it looks like, no matter how it feels. Aim us at you and teach us to love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so what is the relationship between justice and mercy? How do we understand God's heart of mercy? And how does that character inform our actions, our obedience, <clears throat> our walk, our talk of faith? Where does the justice of God come into play? How are we to think about his eternal justice and the terrible reality that hell is for all who pursue evil? And most importantly, how are we to reconcile these seemingly conflicting attributes without dimension either? For both are scripturally true, and both are present in this one passage. We want to start with some background. And the background I'm just going to briefly go through because it's important for us to understand. We have God visiting Abram. Now, remember that during this Christmas season, we've been talking about Christ's appearance in a pre-incarnate form. And I want to trace with you very quickly that this one who was standing and talking to Abraham, because Jesus said nobody has seen God, if it's identified as God, and it is, it had to be Jesus. Okay? So what we see is three men arrive, and they come and receive hospitality from Abram, Abraham and Sarah. Two of them go on towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and one remains. And it's at this time that the language about who remained shifts in the narrative. Until then, Abraham had been calling him my Lord, and we've been seeing the Lord said this, the Lord said that. But here we have a shift, and if you'll notice the type set in your scripture, it says the Lord, all in the capital letters in the Hebrew scripture, that is Yahweh. It's the given name of God. It's the idea that God himself is there for us. And the act of hospitality and the continuation and the refinement of his promise to redeem his people is the background for this visit. Okay? Abraham and Sarah, when they first arrived, whatever Abraham may have immediately thought when the three men appeared, what we know was that the practice of extending hospitality was a very Middle Eastern common thing to do. They would have counted it shameful for somebody to come to their tent and not be received with graciousness, with kindness, with an offer of food, with an offer of refreshment, with an offer of let me do for you whatever it is that I can do. And this is something which is commended to us in the New Testament and, and given to us by way of instruction. And it's interesting to me that the instruction that's given is that if you will be a person who extends hospitality and, and lives in such a way that you can be generous to those who come to you and do good things for them just because they appeared at your doorstep by the mercy and the providence of God, that you might be one who entertains angels unaware. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So Abraham not only entertained these two men who we understand from Scripture to be the angels of God, but he also entertained God himself, right? Just by doing the simple act of being kind to a stranger and opening their home, their tent, to, to travelers who came by and were in need. Now, I say all of this because it's a practice that in our culture... We are sort of opposed to? <laughs> well, we're not in the habit of taking strangers into our homes. We're not in the habit of extending to them genuine hospitality. And often it's because we're concerned for our safety. We're concerned that we might be robbed or murdered or taken advantage of. But the truth of the matter is, is if you trust in God, then trust in God. Okay? 
If, if your heart and your soul and your mind and your person understands that God is the one who holds you, as he must if he is sovereign, then take advantage of the opportunities that God gives you to extend hospitality and to do good for those that God brings into your life. You can do it with wisdom and you can do it with discretion, but your mind and your heart should be aimed at doing good for the people that God brings. Because you never know who they are. You have your assumptions. You have your, your judgments and your, your, your visions of what they look like and what they sound like and what you think they might be, but you don't know who they are. So remember that God is always at work teaching, shaping, changing us and, and, and causing us to have opportunities to learn more of Him. Now Abraham being a spiritually minded person, somewhere in the course of this discourse, figured out who he was talking to. I don't know that anybody else in the camp did. Maybe Sarah, because she was eavesdropping in the tent. But, but aside from that, what's, what's the difference here? Well, spiritual minds receive spiritual truth. Right? Remember that 2 Corinthians 2 tells us that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, nor can he because they are spiritually discerned. And so Abraham, being a spiritually living person, recognized with whom he was dealing. And he was ready to receive the blessing that God had given to him. God delights to bless us with his presence. Does that seem like a strange statement? I mean, what was it that God was giving Abraham at the first part of this? An opportunity to be a blessing, right? But more than that, he was giving to Abraham his own presence. Now, if we're not thinking rightly about our God and about the way that he has ordered the world around us, then it becomes difficult for us to recognize what a blessing that actually is. But the chief of all of God's blessings is himself. It is not the good things that he gives you, it is not financial blessing. It is not physical well-being. It is not opportunities for advancement in employment or any other thing that we might pray for. The chief of God's blessing is himself. Amen. And this is what he was giving Abraham. Just think about this for a minute. He came to visit his friend. Right? You say, well, that's kind of a stretch there, preacher. I'm not sure if I can see that, that, that God saw Abraham as a friend necessarily from this. But do you know that the scripture tells us plainly that God's statement to his people is, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Right? Look at me at Psalm. I want you to see this. Psalm chapter 50. Verses 12 to 15. Psalm chapter 50, verses 12 to 15. God says, If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine in all of its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving. Pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. And I will deliver you. And you shall glorify me. So God's statement is, I don't need your food. I don't need your offerings. I don't need anything from you. So why was God there? To give, right? He was there to be a blessing. And he condescended to allow Abraham to feed him. It just blows my mind that, that God, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and says out loud, I wouldn't tell you if I was hungry, I don't need anything from you. If I want to eat something, I'll take care of it myself. Not that God has a body like us or ever needs to eat. But the point is, he didn't need what Abraham gave him. So by allowing Abraham to give it, he was blessing Abraham's generosity and blessing Abraham's generosity of spirit by allowing Abraham to be a blessing to these strangers in his home. He enjoyed Abraham's company, apparently. 
Now Jesus tells us in John chapter 14 that he calls us friends. I'm sorry, John chapter 15. He says, I no longer call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Right? Those are the words of Jesus to us. So if God demonstrated friendship for Abraham by coming and visiting Abraham, how much more does he demonstrate friendship to us when Jesus has plainly told us, I call you my friends. I call you the people in whom I delight. You are my friends and I have revealed myself to you in powerful ways. He shows us his nature in ways that the world cannot comprehend because they are natural men who do not receive the things of the Spirit of God while we are spiritual men who do. And in no way is this condescension of his revelation more profound than in the final act of his incarnation. Right? Philippians chapter 2. Remember what Paul has to say. He says, Let this mind be in you which also was in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even to the death of a cross. What was the motivation? His humility, his desire to honor God, his love for us. He calls us friends. He said, no greater love does a man have than this than he laid down his life for his friends. Right? This is what he was doing. And when God came and visited Abraham, we see the same friendship being displayed. Now, God also had a purpose in his coming which was about his own nature and his own person. Because remember that every time that Jesus appeared prior to the incarnation as well as in the incarnation, his aim was to teach something about himself. His aim was to teach something about his nature. His aim was to teach something about the God who was, the God who is, the God who calls us out. He wanted to teach us something that was going to be important for us to know. And in this instance, he was continuing the advancement of his intentioned blessing of Abraham. This would be the third time, the fourth time, excuse me, that God had appeared to Abraham in, in some form of either a vision or an actual person appearing. And the first time he spoke to Abraham, he appeared to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. This was Abraham's initial calling and his promise to make him a nation that would bless the earth. In Genesis 15, he gave him the first promise of a son. And he cemented the relationship um, and, and bonded it together with the actual covenant of sacrifice. When Abraham sacrificed the animals and set the parts and God appeared as a furnace and passed between them and that covenant was then sealed as, as God gave him this promise of a covenant. In Genesis, 17, six, I'm sorry, in Genesis 17, the sign of circumcision was given and Abram's name was changed to Abraham. The promise was renewed and the son who was to be born to Abraham through Sarah, his wife, was stated explicitly. Up until this point, a promise had been made that yes, you would have a son, but how it was all come about, not necessarily there, right? This was a restatement of that promise that it would come through Sarah. So God was promising and extending and advancing, and now when he's come in Genesis 18, he has given to, to Abraham and to Sarah an actual time frame. Start now. About this time in a year, I'll be here, and you'll have a baby in your arms. Right? Now, this is God's faithfulness, which has been developed and developing in the life of Abram for a long time. That this has been something that God has been building up and showing and causing Abraham to rest on and to depend upon. And this promise was going to continue despite Abraham's frailty. He was almost 100 years old. His wife was almost 90. Would be 90 and 100 when Isaac is born in a year. But that's not the only frailty, right? Abraham was a man who sometimes had difficulty trusting God. They went to the land of Egypt. 
And what did Abraham do? He didn't trust God. Instead, he lied about Sarah, said, she's not my wife, she's my sister. And he almost got the nation of Egypt toppled because the Pharaoh looked at her and went, I like her. I think I'll have her. Right? Not once, but twice. This man had a problem with telling the truth, apparently. He had a problem with trusting God. And remember when God gave him the promise to do what God told him to do. In Genesis 15, he was told, you'll have a son. And in Genesis 16, he took matters into his own hands and he and Sarah concocted this plan that they would somehow make a son through Hagar, Sarah's maid. He didn't believe God. Okay, I'll have a son, but it won't be with you. You're obviously too old. He didn't trust God. He doubted. He connived. He worked. He did what he thought he was going to do. And in the end, God still remained faithful. God still remained faithful in spite of Sarah's sin in this instance. First she doubted, then she lied. Why did you laugh? I didn't laugh. Right? You see, God's faithfulness does not depend upon our faithfulness, thankfully. Right? God's faithfulness is rooted in who He is. That's why Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2, that if we are faithless, He remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. So what's really the heart of the faithfulness that's being shown here? Remember, this entire instance where Abraham has been selected, called out, and God says, I'm going to make of you a nation. Why? So that out of you will come my promised son, Messiah, who will be a blessing to the whole earth, a blessing to the, to the nations of the earth. Through you... All of the nations of the earth will be blessed because through you will come Messiah. That's what's going on here. God's plan of redeeming for himself a people has been progressing apace regardless of how well or poorly his servants do their job. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that is always the truth. We can thank him for that and should thank him for that regularly because God's plan today is still happening regardless of how well or poorly we do our part. Amen. He is always faithful. He is always progressing with the plan of redemption because his redeeming intention, his covenant of mercy has been unwavering since before he ever said, let there be light. The covenant of redemption did not begin in the Garden of Eden when God pronounced his curse upon man, woman, and Satan. The covenant of redemption began in eternity. And it was a covenant between the persons of the Godhead. An agreement that they would create a people and call a people and save a people. So that that people might know him. And all of the details of the plan, up to and including the fall of man, were worked out in the eternal covenant of redemption because there has never been one single moment in all of eternity when one atom of God's creation is outside of his will. Our God does what our God sets out to do. Amen. But we need to be reminded of because we forget that a lot. Mm -hmm. Every day. Amen? Every day. Mm -hmm. We forget that a lot. We forget just how good and how faithful and how righteous and how true our God is. And Abraham and Sarah were no different. Even though God had pronounced to them the promise and God had told them, look, my plan of redemption, which began long before you were thought of by anybody but me, is now moving forward and I'm going to make of you the nation that will produce my son. And Abraham's thinking to himself, oh, if only you would let Ishmael live. And God said, don't worry, I'll make of him a nation too. But you're probably not going to be so happy about what happens between this nation and the other one. We're still paying that price, by the way. For Ishmael was the father of all the nations that became the Muslims. 
His sin bears consequences today. Right? But is God's faithfulness in question? No. God's faithfulness remains steadfast and true. God's plan remains unswerving. And in everything that he does, this redemption has always been the plan. Mercy and redemption, grace and truth are the sole property of God. And there is a whole lot of noise in the world and oftentimes when people talk about how they can redeem a situation or they can redeem a circumstance or they can do something to redeem this group of people or do something like that, we need to understand that no matter what good we do in somebody's life, if we miss out on the best good, if we miss out on the truth of Christ and do not profess and proclaim the gospel in power to them, all the good that we do them is no good at all. Okay? We do nobody any favors to make their life easier and enable them to stay away from God. So in all of our doing and in all of our work towards redemption, our purpose should always be gospel-centered, gospel-focused, Christ-honoring, Christ-exalting, so that what we do aligns itself with what God is doing because God is always redeeming. God is always in the business of laboring to bring about the purposed plan that He has ordained. Amen. But justice is also the sole property of God. And justice and mercy exist in equal measures within the God who is. And we find that very hard to see. We find that very hard to understand. For us, those two concepts seem to be at odds. And oftentimes, you will hear people who ought to know better, men who profess themselves to be Christians, men who profess themselves to be preachers, will say things like this. They will say that mercy triumphs over justice. Understand that that is a lie from the pit of hell. Mercy triumphs. Because justice was satisfied. Mm -hmm. Mercy triumphed. Because God is just. And what Paul writes in Romans chapter 3 is that God vindicated his own righteousness in pouring out his wrath upon his son because he had foregone the destruction that our sin deserved. He had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Instead, deferring our punishment until the time when he would lavish it upon the Son. Justice is not the cry of God in a longing manner. When God says, I'm going to have justice, he's not going, oh, if only justice would come. It's a stated intention. Justice is coming. Justice will be satisfied. And all sin will be paid for, either in Christ or in you. And those are the only two options. There is no other way in which sin can be atoned for. There is no other manner in which the debt of our sin can be paid. Either Christ will pay it in full and remove that obligation from us, or we will be standing to our own account and paying for our own sin with an eternity in hell. Those are the only two choices that are open to anybody. And do not allow anybody to try and convince you otherwise. Because that reality shapes and forms everything else that we do. It is incredibly important that we really understand what's going on here. Okay, God came to remind Abraham, I'm still in the business of redeeming. Oh, and by the way, we're heading over to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because justice also matters. Does it strike anybody as strange that these two instances, these two encounters, there's one encounter, encompass both of these realities? Right? God came to see Abraham to remind him that redemption was being worked out and to give him a timetable and a stamp by which he would understand that redemption is being worked out. Oh, and by the way, the next major step occurs now. 
right? Oh, and while I'm here, we're on our way to Sodom and Gomorrah because judgment is also coming. And in doing this, God demonstrates that he is going to include Abraham and us in the work that he is doing. In the work for mercy and in the work for justice. It is not about God having need, but it is about God having a determination to bless us with his purpose. He states, because of the relationship that he has with Abraham, I will not hide from him what I'm doing. Did you notice that? Look at me again, Genesis chapter 18. I want you to see this because it's really startling to me. Verse 17 in Genesis 18, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So God says, look, because we're in this relationship, because I have set my love upon Abraham and I have determined that he is the vessel of my redemption, he needs to understand what's going on. Because part of his job is to proclaim the truth about who I am to his descent. Part of Abraham's job is to declare the truth of the nature and the character and the purpose of God to those who come to him and come out of him by the mercy of God. Abraham is going to be responsible to declare the nature and the character of God. To know the law of God. Right? This is before the law was codified for Moses. But the law was still the law. God's character is unchanging. And the entirety of the Ten Commandments, the entirety of the codified law of God, demonstrates for us the reality of what God's character and nature really is. These are not abstract concepts. That's why they will never be set aside. So those who want to proclaim that as Christians, we're not under law but under grace and therefore the law has no purpose, are only demonstrating their own ignorance and refusal to understand the truth of what God's law was. Scripture tells us indeed that no flesh has ever been justified by the works of the law. It's because we cannot live up to the standard of God's righteousness. But that does not commend to us one minute the idea that having been saved, we are no longer bound and obligated to obey the nature of God. For the law of God reflects His nature. He calls us to know who He is so that we might walk with Him. Amen. And this is exactly what He's demonstrating with Abraham. Abraham, you're my friend. I want to hang out with you. I'll even let you feed me even though I'm not hungry. Right? Right? And by the way, because you're my friend, and because I'm going to bless the world through you, and because we're in this relationship together, I'm going to make sure that you understand what's going on, because I'm going down to Sodom to destroy it. I'm sending my angel on their way. You need to understand what's happening here. Because if you're going to know me, Abraham, you have to know me in the totality of who I am. And this is a message that we need to be reminded of in this day and age. We don't necessarily like God in the totality of who he is in this country. We like a God of our own imagination. We like a God who's friendly, who's easy to get along with because he expects nothing of us. We like a God who wants only to bless us with good and comfortable things. We like a God who's really just like a big slot machine in the sky or Santa Claus with different clothes. We are called to know and to love God in the fullness of who He is. Amen. We don't get to pick and choose his attributes and say, well, I'm not really keen on his wrath and judgment. 
I'm not really happy with his idea of justice. I think that it's much better if people are just allowed to live however they want, then God should just love them. You might say such things, but all you're doing if you say that is confessing the reality that you yourself may not know God and that you yourself might not be saved. For God is a God who is the fullness of everything that he says he is. And he's unwilling that Abraham would not know this about him. <coughs> Justice is coming. But Abraham, no. He's a different sort of cat. Because what Abraham begins to do is show us that he, he knows that he's a friend of God. And since he's a friend of God, well, what do you do with your friends? You, you talk. <laughs> you communicate with them. You, you conversate. And he says, well, well I, I just had a question. It's just a little question. What if, what if there were 50 righteous people? When you get to Sodom, I, I know how terrible Sodom and Gomorrah is. I was there just a few years ago. I remember. He was there a few years ago. He went and he rescued Lot, who'd been carried off. And so he, he knew. He understood what Sodom and Gomorrah was. Well, what if what if Sodom and Gomorrah contained fifty righteous people? Would you still destroy it? And God says, "Oh, okay, that's good to know. I know that you have mercy as well as justice, but but let me ask another question. What, what if there were only forty-five? I mean, would you really destroy all of the city for just the lack of?" And God said, no. Wow, that's good to know. Well, what if there were only 40? I mean, I'm only dust and ashes. Who am I to talk to you? But what if there's only 40? No, I wouldn't destroy it for the sake of 40. What about 30? I'm on a roll here. <laughs> no. No, I wouldn't destroy it for the sake of 30. What about 20? I would not destroy it for the sake of 20. I just have one more question. I think he stopped too soon. I just have one more question. What if there were only 10? And God said, I would not destroy it for the sake of 10 righteous. Now, if you think for one minute that Abraham just negotiated God out of something he was intending to do. No. You don't understand what we just saw. Because remember, when God comes, what is he always doing? He's teaching us about himself, right? He's revealing himself to us. So what is God teaching us through this encounter with Abraham, this bold assertion of Abraham's relationship because that's really what this is, right? This is a very bold assertion on Abraham's part. God has said, I'm going to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to check out to find out that the rumors are true. Not that God didn't really know, but this is the enacting of full judgment and full justice, right? Even God recognizes due process. There's a word for us in this day. Even God recognizes due process. So he says, I'm going down to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to investigate. I'm going to examine it. The truth will come out. If it's not as bad as the report is, I'll know. But if it is, I'm going to destroy it. That's God's statement. Is that the fullness of what he's doing? No, he's also teaching Abraham about the relationship that he has with him and about the power that God himself has invested in that relationship and given to his children. Because remember, did God need Abraham to produce Messiah? No. 
Did God need anybody to produce Messiah? No. God had a purpose and a plan, and that plan is unswerving, and part of his plan is that his children would know him and understand him and be made like unto him. And Abraham demonstrates his heart and his love and his concern, and he begins to intercede for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and intercede for those evil people that were dwelling therein. Because this is really what we're seeing here. We're seeing the very first instance that I can understand about intercessory prayer in the, in the life of the Christian. And Abraham is interceding on behalf of the evil and on behalf of the wicked men of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he is begging God, please God, have mercy on them. And in the process, God is teaching Abraham about not only the relationship that he has with him, but about the power of prayer. Now there's a whole lot of other teaching tools going on here, because remember, Abraham was aware of what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so there's always something going on in the teaching in these moments when God is revealing things to us. And do not lose sight of the fact that you will be taught by evil men around you. Okay? And I'm not talking necessarily about being taught how to do evil. If you have your eyes open, you begin to understand the terrible evil that is around us in the world today. So if I were to say to you right now, what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Nobody's going to have any hesitation whatsoever. It was homosexuality. We know that. That's what the scripture says. That was the problem going on. But you understand that homosexuality, even according to Paul in Romans, is not the beginning of sin, but instead it's a capstone. Right? There was a lot of other evils going on in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. There was much shedding of innocent blood. Does that sound like a nation that we might know today? Where a million babies are murdered every year for the convenience of women who can't be bothered to raise their children and men that can't be bothered to assume their responsibilities? A million a year. And a government that says, oh, it's absolutely right, and we will fight tooth and nail, twisting the law and changing the rules to make sure that we can keep our agenda in place. There was much, much abuse of the poor using them for their own aims. Withholding from the needy and the poor the good that we should be doing to them for the sake of our own desires and agenda and manipulation. I expect if all of the pork barrel that was being bandied about in Washington today was stripped out of the process, that all of the good that needs to be done to make this nation a comfortable place for everybody could be accomplished for a tenth of what we're spending. If we just took away the graph, if we just made it illegal for politicians to get rich off of doing the things that they're asked to do, not using their power to abuse and to twist and to manipulate. You see, these are the things that were going on. Look at me in Ezekiel. You say, wait a minute, we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. But look at Ezekiel chapter 16. Because remember, the whole council of Scripture is the whole council of Scripture. And God speaks to us through the entirety of His Word. So even Ezekiel might have something to say. Ezekiel chapter 16, and verses 48 and following. As I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters has done as you and your daughters have done. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. Isn't it remarkable that God doesn't mention homosexuality in that description of Sodom and Gomorrah?
pride, abundance of food, good things, idleness, haughtiness, arrogance, abominations, okay. But he doesn't come right out and put his finger on it because that wasn't the issue. The issue was ultimately the matters of the heart that drove them to worship themselves rather than their God. And make no mistake about it, when you have plenty and you're idle and you're full of pride because you have plenty, you will not be worshiping God. Amen? Instead, you'll be worshiping yourself in some form or another. And that's exactly what was going on. Now, how are we to be taught by this? Well, we're to be taught by this to be careful, first of all. We're to be taught by this to be alert and aware and to look at our own lives and recognize the tendencies to go towards these things ourselves. Because this was not a Sodom and Gomorrah problem. This is a sin problem, which makes it a human problem. Amen? Amen? It affects all of us. And oftentimes we feel very superior because we may not be engaged in that sin. But don't lose sight of the fact for one minute that God hates all of our sin. Abraham was aware of what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham had been instructed in righteousness and he allowed the truth of the things that he knew to drive him towards his God instead of pull him away. And this is something that needs to happen in our lives. When we see the evil in the world around us and we see the wickedness being rampantly promoted in every possible way, we see righteousness being suppressed, we see truth being exterminated, erased, eliminated from any conversation in our culture whatsoever. When we see these things going on, we have two options. We either run towards God or we run away from Him. And make no mistake, if you give in to, to hatred and despair and, and furious anger over these things that, that just boils up and spews out all over everybody around you, you are not running towards God. Do not deceive yourself that you are engaged in righteous indignation. Because that's not what it is. You're running away from God and you're pursuing wrath. You're pursuing your own pursuits. You're pursuing your own desires because you feel superior. And you feel like, I'm not like them. Therefore, I can do what I want to do. And I may not want to do what they want to do, which makes me superior, but I sure can do the things that I want to do. Right? That defines us. That's the human condition. We need to understand that, beloved, you're not like them because God reached into your mess and grabbed a hold of your heart. Amen. If it weren't for that, you would not only be like them, you would likely be worse. You need to remember this. You see, an intercessory prayer cannot take place when you're feeling superior. You might pray for somebody, but you're not interceding for them. You know? Oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. <laughs> if you're interceding for somebody, there has to be something of a heart of compassion to recognize that they're in the condition that they're in only because God has not seen fit to draw them out of it yet. And that you're in the condition that you're in because he did. That's a matter of mercy. That's a matter of his mercy in your life. And intercessory prayer says, God, please give mercy to them as well. And this is what we see happening in Abraham. Because understand that refusal to submit to God is a problem that is worse for us than things were for Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus has this to say. 
starting in verse 23. You, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. I defy anybody to show me any nation in the history of the world that has experienced such a long and powerful display of the mercy and providence and grace of God that has been lavished on this one. It would have been better for us to never have had any of it if we do not lay hold of it for the sake of righteousness. Because all of the good things that we accumulate for ourselves will be counted to our destruction and to our condemnation. For the mighty works that were done in Capernaum have been done here. And done here. And done here. And done here. Beloved, God calls us to repent. And he calls us to understand that wickedness around us should break our hearts. It should break us that, that our nation looks like it looks, that the things that are going on are going on, that they are celebrated. But it should also instruct us. It should teach us what needs to happen. It should never be seen as something desirable. And it should never be seen as something which exalts us to look down our holy noses at somebody else. It should instruct and inform our hearts. And it should cause us to recognize that we are dependent upon the mercy of God. By the purpose of the heart and the mind of the leaders of this nation, we are being led further and further astray. And that also should be indicative to us and educating us about the things that are going on. It should instruct us that we need to be praying for them as well. We're commanded to pray for them, by the way that we might live peaceable lives. Paul said, if you'll just pray for leaders and all those in authority, you might have a peaceful life. So do it. Pray for them. Pray for their salvation. Pray for God to change their hearts. Pray for God to stop their plans of evil. Pray for God to turn them unto himself. This is what we are called to do. This is the instruction that is being given to us. And in the end, we also have been given the privilege of being leaders ourselves over the sphere of our influence. Amen? Amen? To raise up our children in the ways of the Lord, to teach everybody who God brings into our life who He is. What are we doing with these opportunities? Are we teaching them the truth? Are we fulfilling the obligation that God has placed on our lives to magnify His name? Are we dedicating the relationships that God has brought into our lives to His kingdom? Do you understand that there is not a single person in your life that God has not placed there? Right? Not a single one. So you've got to ask yourself the question, why are they here? Don't you think Abraham was asking himself the question, God, why are you telling me this? What, why me? Why has my nephew gone to live in Sodom? <clears throat> right? Why is there somebody there that I care about? Why me? Why are you teaching me these things? Why am I the one who is supposed to be interceding for them right now? Well, the only answer is because you are. In the infinite will of God, in His perfect wisdom and understanding, He's chosen you for this task. Mm -hmm. And the relationships that are in your life should be pulling you to be praying for them, to be interceding for them, to be speaking the truth of who God is to them, to be seeing them 
hopefully, prayerfully moved towards the kingdom. Amen. We're not to be aloof from sinners. And we're not supposed to be their best friends and go at all their evil places and do all their wicked things, but we're not supposed to be aloof from them. You say, well, I'm not quite sure how to balance that. Let me give you this. Start praying for them. God will sort that. Okay? Start interceding for them. Get down on your knees and plead with God for them in the same fashion that we see Abraham pleading with God for the sake of Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> because ultimately we are also taught by prayer itself. Because our prayers indicate what we believe about God. Yes. Don't they? If you're praying to a God who you believe is sovereign, if you're praying to a God that you actually believe is infinite and omnipotent and good and gracious, your prayers are going to sound and be a whole lot different than if you're praying to some God that you think is capricious and incompetent and somehow unable to do anything anyway unless people help him out. Your prayers are going to be very, very different. Because your prayer life reveals what you actually believe about God. How you pray speaks volumes about who He is. Is He infinitely great? Is He transcendently holy? Is He incomprehensibly glorious? Is He absolutely, unboundedly good and gracious? If He is all of these things, then your prayer life should reflect that. Your prayer life also reflects what you believe about yourself. Did you catch it when Abraham was talking to God? I'm, I'm just dust and ashes, God. Who am I to speak to you? Right? Now, I want you to notice two things about that. First of all, he didn't stop. Right? But he was keenly aware of exactly what he was. He wasn't coming to God arrogantly. He wasn't coming to God going, Hey, God, I got an idea. You need to listen to me because I'm smarter than you. And sometimes that's what our prayers sound like. Sometimes we pray like we're telling God what He needs to do. He was coming to God with humility. He was coming to God aware of who He is and how He actually needs to be understanding. He understood that He was an object of mercy. And He understood that He was praying for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and asking God to make them recipients of grace. See, there's a right understanding in, in proper prayer, a right understanding of who God is, and a right understanding of who you are. And Abraham met this balance quite beautifully. He, he, he laid this out for us. And I find that it's remarkable that infinite God, who already knew the truth about Sodom and Gomorrah, who already had intended what he was going to do, and already knew that there were ten righteous men, still he was willing to listen. Still, he was willing to engage with Abraham. And he was willing to allow Abraham to explore this relationship and explore this power of prayer and to explore what it was to come before him to understand that what Abraham said was true. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Because ultimately, that's really what Abraham is being convinced of, isn't it? If you're a friend of God, you have to rest in the truth that whatever God does is righteous and good regardless. Amen. And that's sometimes a really bitter pill for us to swallow. Because sometimes God righteously and justly does things that we do not want Him to do. Sometimes He takes away people that we love. Sometimes He severs relationships that we think are okay. Sometimes He withholds our toys from us. Sometimes He does things that we think are good which really are designed to teach us that the thing that we thought was good was not good to begin with, and it's actually to our harm instead of to our benefit. But he does that because we set so much passion on these things that we're just not happy without them. See, if we're a friend of God, we have to grow up to understand that whatever God does is right. And although Abraham confessed this early in this prayer, by the time he whittled his number all the way down to 10, I think he actually believed it. 
the judge of all the earth will do what's right. And whatever he finds in Sodom and Gomorrah, he'll do what's right with it. I said earlier, I've always believed that Abraham stopped too soon. That if he had said to God, God, would you not spare Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of one righteous man? That God would have said yes. Maybe yes. Maybe no. Knowing the character of God as I do, I still defend that position. I think that that's the truth. I think that had Abraham gone on. But understand this. All of our prayers, intercessory or no, are guided and led and empowered by the Spirit of God. And God is not willing to allow us to press farther than He is willing to grant. But He is always desiring that His children ask huge things of Him. Right? I mean, knowing Sodom and Gomorrah as he knew it, even asking for God to spare them for the sake of ten is a pretty huge thing. Amen? See, ultimately, this is about the relationship between Abraham and God and what it teaches us about the relationship between God and his creation and between God and ourselves. Because God is always instructing His children exactly who He is. Amen. God is always in the process of teaching us His character and His nature and His person. He is always in the process of revealing Himself to us. And in the end, Abraham learned that God could be trusted. Because what's missing in this entire encounter is any indication from Scripture that God was actually getting annoyed with Abraham's questions. Right? Abraham's going, well, I'll just ask one more and then I'll be silent, right? I don't think there was any, I don't see anything in Scripture that indicates that God was going, come on, man, get it over with. Again, another question? Right? Because God's a much better father than we are. Amen. <laughs> I have to confess that sometimes I was very impatient with my impetuous children and their constant questioning of everything. And sometimes their questions were a bit rebellious. But a lot of times their questions were just the desire to understand. And I have to confess that sometimes my patience ran a little bit thin. But God never. Abraham took this prayer and pushed it as far as he could, believing that God was listening because God was, and trusting that God would do what was right. But what I want to draw our attention to is the reality of what it is that God has done. Because what God has done is to have given to us a model for how we should be interacting with the nation of Sodom and Gomorrah in which we live. We should be praying for this nation. Praying earnestly for this nation. Begging God for the sake of even ten righteous men will you not spare us. Because to look at the signs that are going on around us, this nation is headed for destruction. We are so far off the rails, uh, it boggles the imagination. We no longer give any credence to our own founding documents. We have a government in place which is very content to twist the rules to its own perspective and ignore the Constitution that formed us. Now, I'm not trying to be political here, but I'm just saying, if you look at the signs and you look at the state of evil and you look at the condition of everything that's going on in this land, we are headed for destruction. Amen. And the only thing that will spare this land is God. Amen. Beloved, I don't know about you, but I want to have a part in that. Pray for this land. Pray for our president. Resist the urge to mock him. 
Resist those feelings that rise up in you when our governor and, and her cronies do yet another thing to destroy babies. Pray for her. Ask God to change her heart. Because the only difference between your way of seeing the world and hers is the mercy of God. Beloved, that's true of all of our nation. Not only our leaders, but our neighbors and the people that we live by that are engaged in evil all the time. That live their lives to the pursuit of their own desires and the pursuit of their own flesh. And think that nobody has the right to tell them anything whatsoever. But God came down and met with Abraham briefly. To tell Abraham that his son was coming, who would stay with us forever. To tell Abraham that God is unchanging, filled with justice and mercy, and that they have met. God came down and spoke into the life of his servant Abraham. Words that I don't imagine Abraham really wanted to hear. But he did so, so that Abraham would do exactly what he did. So that Abraham would pray and ask for mercy for these people. Beloved, in this moment and in this day, God meets with us give us the opportunity to ask for mercy for this people. He calls us to engage in prayer, to engage in intercessory prayer, to engage on our knees for our King. And that is the only thing that will turn this nation around. Do everything that's in your power to do. Be a good citizen. Be involved in the process. Vote. To do whatever is right and legal and true. But don't put your faith in those things. No political party, no political action committee is the hope of America. God is the hope of America. And if we believe that's true, and I hope that we do, then we need to be seeking Him and asking Him to intervene and to grant mercy, to call the dead to life so that their hearts might be made. That's why Jesus came. He came to bring peace. Not peace between us, that's secondary. But peace between us and God. Because if we're all at peace with our God, you know what's remarkable? We'll all be at peace with each other as well. Amen. Because what God does when people love Him is He makes them love each other. This is why Jesus said, they'll know you're Christians in this. But you have love one for another. And just like most of everything else, we get the car before the horse. We focus on the byproduct instead of on the root. We need to be asking God to change the hearts of this nation. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give to us grace. I pray that you would give to us courage and that you would give to us strength, Father, to proclaim your truth. And I ask, God, that in the midst of this day, you, Lord, you, would change our hearts to make us a people passionate for intercessory prayer for this nation. God, we do pray for our president. We do pray for our governor. We pray for all of those in power and authority over us. We pray recognizing that you put them there. And we pray asking for forgiveness in repentance for the sin that made you choose such people as our leaders. 
And we ask you, God, to turn their hearts to you. That they would no longer walk in ways that are against your truth. That none of our leaders, God, would walk in ways that are against your truth. We pray that you would transform this land and make it once more a bastion of truth and righteousness. Amen. A place where Christ is honored and the land where truth is revered. We ask all of this in the name of the King of Peace and the one true thing in all of creation. Amen. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.